I want to read my text from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And then also I want to look at a parallel text in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. But first of all, we'll read from Mark's Gospel. Um, at verse chapter 1 at verse 21 and they went into Capernaum he and the disciples and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught and they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Now, the, essentially the very same thing we have in Luke's gospel. It is the very same event. But Luke uses a couple of words, synonyms, different than uh, than Mark does. I think we see in this the genius of divine inspiration. The choice of the words in many cases will be that of the, the, uh, the human author, yet everything is guided by the Holy Spirit yeah, so that he is writing divinely inspired, both of the writers are. But just a couple of little differences that I think are important for our purpose tonight. We see here in this passage, they came down to Capernaum, that is, they came down from Nazareth to Capernaum. Verse 32, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. His word was with power. Down in verse 36, they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth unclean spirits, and they do come out. We see in verse 35 that Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him. But we see there, there was a man with an unclean devil, and Christ removed him simply by the word of his mouth. Now both Mark and Luke preface their accounts of this event by noting the amazing or the amazement of the people over the power and the authority of Christ's words. Mark says they were astonished at his doctrine. Luke says they were astonished for his word was with power. This, uh, this same amazement was also expressed, has been in other places in Scripture and on other occasions. One notably is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Matthew makes the same notation and says the people were astonished, for he taught as one having authority. So our, this was observed and made note of on more than one occasion. And we have many other places in scripture where the same essential thing is being said, but just in different ways. For example, when the, the officers came back and just simply as an excuse for why they hadn't apprehended him, said no man ever spake as this man. So they were saying the same thing essentially, not in the detail that is recorded here in these two gospels. Now, it was a singular authority, it was a singular power of the Savior's words that made this impression upon them that so impressed them. They were struck with awe 
at the, at the power of his word. He spoke with authority so that no man could question his doctrine. And he spoke with such power so that everyone felt the force of the truth that he delivered. They were astonished, we read, at his doctrine. For his word was with power. And then we see in Luke 4, 36, what word is this? Exclamation point. They exclaim, what word is this? That even the devils have to obey it. Why was it that the Savior's teaching had such power? Why did it have such remarkable authority? What was it about it? Why do we suppose, why do you suppose that Jesus' words had the effect on its hearers that it had? And we have these examples that we looked at tonight and we could look at many more beside. But I would just say this for one thing, he spoke truth, and truth is powerful. There is something about truth that resonates and is self-confirming. Uh, falsehood is not that way. Falsehood will always prove to be empty as the flattery and deception of which it is, of which it consists. It will always prove to be empty. Now, as much as we want to believe flattering words that are spoken about us, we, uh, we know what is flattery, flattery and what is truth. As far as deception is concerned, deception requires delusion. In order to receive that which is intended to deceive, you have to be afflicted with some kind of delusion. You know, the Lord said that he would send them great delusion that they would believe a lie. And so delusion is always connected to the believing of that which is not true. But certainly, as far as truth is concerned, uh, it stands on its own. It confirms itself in those that hear it. Deception requires, as I said, delusion. Sometimes it's self-delusion that is experienced. I enjoy watching these uh, interrogations, the, the interrogation part of these real crime programs. Uh, to watch the suspect or the per person of interest uh, as he is questioned and to try and determine if they're being truthful or not. And you know, most can't pull it off. If they are guilty and they're trying to deceive and try to lie, they can't pull it off because there's just something about a lie that a person knows that it's a lie. And I know there are some that are clever liars and they're more convincing than others. But the pros, these detectives doing the questioning, they're hard to fool. But it doesn't matter, as far as self-delusion is concerned, it doesn't matter how obvious the attempt to deceive is on the part of the suspect or how damning the evidence is against him. There will always be those who plead their innocence. The family members, oh, I know he didn't do it. There might be a mountain of evidence and he's lying through his teeth as he says he didn't do it but they are willing to be deceived because as I said, the self-delusion is involved in this thing. My dad always observed the eyes. And of course, we've all heard the expression, shifty eyes, well, kind of shifty eyed. I don't know if you can trust him or not. Uh, or if a person can't look you in the eye, you know, it's usually a pretty, pretty good indication they're probably not being truthful with you. But beyond that, uh, uh, my dad studied the eyes. He saw the, the expression in the eyes. He could identify people by their eyes even after years of not seeing them. And uh, I've seen him do it many times. But he also, having taught school for 46 years, is pretty good at looking in the eye 
of a student and know if they're being truthful or not. But part of our original equipment, actually, as God's creatures, is a pretty good truth detector, or you might say a lie detector, where we have built in us the ability to discern if someone is telling the truth. Now, I'm not saying that this is infallible because everything about us has been made defective in the fall. We know that, but man is equipped with a conscience, and therefore he is able to determine truth from error. Truth is born witness of by that which is written upon the human heart. That is by the Creator. For even unregenerate men are a law unto themselves, the Scripture says, uh, their conscience also bearing witness as to what is true and what is not true, what is right and what is wrong. There is that conscience of man that serves us in this way. You know, when it comes to truth and one that speaks the truth and Christ preaching the truth and our preaching the truth, even a man's anger at the truth or his resistance of the truth is just so much evidence that proves that he recognizes the truth for what it is, that it is true. And if it's indicting him, then the indictment is deserved, it's true. Truth resonates even with fallen mankind. And we know that this is true. And Jesus spoke truth. Jesus spoke the truth. But not only that, he was truthful in his manner. The Lord was truthful in the way that he spoke. And therefore his words had power. Not only was it true, but he spoke in a truthful manner. Truth can be spoken of in a doubtful manner. I think we've all heard preachers, for example, deliver a message that perhaps it was true, but just in the manner in which it was delivered, it didn't seem to be delivered with conviction. Truth can be spoken without the force of conviction. And you can be sure that Jesus spoke as the oracle of God without with the complete fullness of heart, nothing was insincere. Any time that he spoke, nothing appeared fraudulent in the least because he was truth, he is truth, speaking truth. And therefore, it comes across as authoritative. People recognize the power of it because you have one who is truth speaking the truth, speaking in a truthful manner with conviction. And so the words have great weight. There is an, was an obvious difference, easily detected by the people that heard. They said he speaks with authority, not as the scribes, not as the scribes and Pharisees. They saw the difference right off between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and the way that they spoke. The scribes and the Pharisees gave opinions. They gave their opinions supported by the rabbi. They quibbled over matters of practical, uh, that had absolutely no practical importance to them at all. But yet they would debate and quibble over uh, genealogies and all sorts of things, and they were expert at that. The people heard these things continually from the scribes and the Pharisees. They were wonderfully clear on the matter of, of tithing of the mint and the anise. They were well-versed in all of those things. They could, uh, they could enlarge copiously on the washings of the, the cup and the washing of the basin and the washing of the hands and all of these rules and regulations they had, they could go on forever about these things. They were very profound on the, uh, the phylacteries and all of these outward things, the uh, borders of the garments and all of that. 
the scribes and the Pharisees. These people heard them speak. They heard the things they had to say. Regarding the scriptures, well, they were letter men, you know, whose sole purpose was to display their own wisdom. They were far more at home lecturing on the traditions of the fathers, the traditions of the elders, than they were in the scriptures themselves. So these people could easily see, no, there's a difference. What this man has to say, he says with authority. There's power, there's authority in his words. He doesn't speak like the scribes and the Pharisees. He was, there was nothing of self-display with him. That was not his motive. Although they could not help but marvel at him, no doubt about that. Yet notice, they said, what doctrine is this? That's what impressed them. What word is this? They heard his words. Why were his words so powerful? The Holy Spirit had descended upon him at his baptism. The Holy Spirit rested upon him, bore witness in the conscience of men by the divine operation. This is why his words were so powerful. One reason why, the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit without measure. When he spoke of sin, the Holy Spirit was there to convince the world of sin. When he spoke of righteousness, the Holy Spirit was there to convince the hearers of righteousness. When he spoke of judgment to come, the Holy Spirit was there to convince of judgment to come. He had the Holy Spirit without measure and because of his unlimited anointing with the Holy Spirit, our Lord spoke with such astonishing power and authority that all who heard him were compelled to feel that no ordinary teacher was standing before them. There is something special about this man and the thing special about him was, it was truth speaking truth to truth. It was and doing so in the power of the Holy Spirit. No, he was not like the scribes and the Pharisees. There was a marked difference. And something else about Jesus' words that made them so powerful is that he spoke of his own things. You know, in John 8, 44, Jesus said to the unbelieving Jews, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own because he's a liar and he's the father of it. And as the father, so are the children. The scribes and the Pharisees, liars, just like their father, the devil. And it was obvious, but here is truth incarnate. Christ is truth incarnate. To lie would be absolutely impossible for the Lord Jesus Christ. That for him to speak was to be speaking truth. He could not lie. Now we need this kind of a bold confidence today as we preach the truth. Now we cannot speak as this man spake. There's no doubt when the chief priest and the Pharisees demanded to know why the officers had not apprehended him, as I said before, they just simply answered, never man spake like this man. And we can't speak like he spoke, though we certainly wish we could. But we can speak what he spoke. We have his word, we have the word of God, and we can speak the same thing, we can speak the same truth as he spoke. So let it, and we need to endeavor to speak even as he spoke as pertaining to the purity of truth, uncompromising the truth, confidence in the truth, boldness to declare it without apology. That's what I always marveled and do marvel as I read the Gospels and see the way that the Lord answered the scribes and the Pharisees, answered his enemies and the wisdom with which he spoke. And there was never anything that resembled a backing down or an apologizing for what he's gonna say or what he said. 
Oh, he spoke the absolute truth without apology, and he always spoke exactly the right thing. Full dependency upon the power of truth proclaimed. We need that, that confidence. It needs to be even with the words that we speak that people would recognize, that we would recognize the power and the authority of the Word of God. We have no, no authority in, in and of ourselves, but the Word we speak is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. It is the power that cast out the devils, that cast out this unclean devil in this case. It was the power of the Word and of course, that is the very emphasis that is being made and the one that we need to have made. Nothing else can overthrow the devil. Nothing else can uh, loose the poor sinner from the bondage of sin. Nothing can release the sinner from the cruel influence of Satan in his life. This man is tormented having this unclean devil. And you can see the kind of master that this devil has been in the way that he leaves, even in obedience, which he had no choice. When Jesus told him to get out, he had no choice but to do it. But he tore the guy and threw him as he is leaving. There is nothing else that can quell skepticism like the word. I think debating truth is sometimes valuable, sometimes necessary. We're all to be good apologists, to be able to give an account concerning the faith that lies in us. Not only that, be able to defend the faith, but there's nothing to con that can quell skepticism like the truth itself, just simply declaring the truth. And I like to remember this when I'm witnessing. I hope you do too. To rely upon not my ability to persuade somebody, that'll fail every time. And if it would persuade them in such a way, they probably wouldn't truly be persuaded anyway. A lot of personal evangelism, that's all it amounts to, just trying to outwit the guy and try to somehow trick him into believing or to influence them and persuade them some way. Yes, we are to try to persuade men. Paul said we persuade men knowing the, the wrath of God, knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but how do we do it? If we're not doing it with the Word of God, they're not really being persuaded. But there's nothing to quell skepticism and overcome rebellion and resistance like the Word of God itself. Now we have here proof of that. We have the power of Christ words demonstrated before their eyes. They marveled, as I said, both of these authors they, uh, they begin their, to tell this by stating the way that the people were amazed at the authority of his word, at the word that he spoke. And as he sees this, he gives them a demonstration of the power of his word, the proof of that power right there before their eyes and right here before our eyes. Jesus singled out an extreme case with this demonstration. Now here is a man totally possessed by the devil. The very antithesis of God incarnate is this man here. This man represents the worst of cases one in whom the devil had full power. We see that he is a man with an unclean spirit or an unclean devil in the power of the devil. Luke says a man with an unclean devil, that is an undisguised devil. I think that's an important uh, description we know that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen tells us that he can do that. But in this case, there's no disguise. 
the disguise is taken off. It is the devil. And he is seen as an undisguised devil. And this is the one that is controlling this man. This man pictures one that's so fully given over to sin, to a reprobate mind, that there is not a, just imagine a person that is completely mastered by every vice that there is. Drink and dope and gaming and porn and every other addiction you can think of. Picture a man under these things bound by the cords of sin as with a cart rope. That's what this man is. And yet our Lord delivered him with a word. The Lord delivered him without doing anything. He didn't, didn't get into a knock down, drag out argument with the devil. He didn't do anything except just speak. And his word was obeyed. You can see it as they saw it and then be amazed at the awesome power of Christ's words. The word knows no limit to its power. Literally, there is no limit to the power of Christ's words. It's the power of the word that we find here to be so marvelous. The word alone unaccompanied by anything else, unaided by anything else, as we say, the naked word, absolutely nothing else, totally independent. On other occasions, we know that he was pleased to demonstrate the same power that he had by incorporating various procedures. It's still the power of the word, we know that. We know on one occasion he stretched forth his hand and touched the leper and said, I will be thou clean. That was in Matthew 8, 3. Luke 4 and verse 40, that's just after this. He had, after he finished here at the synagogue, he went to Peter's house and healed his mother-in-law, assisted her to her feet, and then there were multitudes coming the rest of the day and into the night, into the wee hours, multitudes. And the scripture says he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them, put his hands right on them. Luke seven fourteen, he reached out and touched the beer of the dead son of the widow of Nain and he restored life to the sun. And you can go on and on. There are countless examples in the, how he made clay and spittle and put on the eyes of a blind man. These types of things he would do for various reasons. But in this case, he is emphasizing the great truth that the Roman centurion in Matthew chapter eight understood and declared when he said to the Lord, and the Lord said he was going to come to his house and heal his servant. And that centurion said, there's no need for that. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Even from a distance, you just speak the word. That centurion knew something about his authority, the authority of his word. He said, I'm a man in authority. And I say to this one, do this and to that one, do that. I say to this one, go here, to that one, go there. They do it because I'm a man of authority. And what he's saying is your word has that kind of authority that you can speak from here and my servant will be healed. That is the point that is being stressed here in this, this story, not a parable, a true story. So let us understand this as well. And may we never doubt the power of the word of God and may we never feel that it is overmatched, no matter how hard the case may be. We, I know that I'm guilty of it and you probably are too. Sometimes we see a sinner so, so bound in sin that we somehow doubt that 
just witnessing the gospel is going to even help. Why do we think that way? We see a man here. How could anybody be more completely given over to Satan and bound in sin as this man here? And yet he spoke a word and delivered him. The power of the gospel. When we give the gospel to a lost soul, we cannot doubt its power. Otherwise, we are doing what I mentioned earlier, speaking the word of God doubtfully, not in the manner that Christ spoke. He was the living word, and when he spoke the word, there was no doubt that he was one with the word and believed what he was saying. And so we must too have that same confidence because it is his word that we speak. Now the protest that was made by this, the wicked one here, the devil, was without effect. Let us alone, he said. The devil is speaking for the man who was now fully compliant. And he said, let us alone. Against this loud protest, Jesus gave a short but very sharp order. In verse 30, 25, hold thy peace and come out of him. Literally, be muzzled and come out. This word was effectual. Who hath resisted his will? It is equal to the hard task. Whatever the case is, the word of God is equal. The word of God can produce the victory. The word of God can deliver that soul that's nearest hell. So let us not doubt the power of the preached word and let us not resort to anything else in these dark days than the power of the word of God let us not be willing to sacrifice one jot nor tittle of the word because it is the power of God unto salvation. We declare it with that confidence and pray that God will make it effectual and bless it to that end.